We need power to live our lives. To run our homes, for business, and for pleasure. The ceaseless demand for energy continues. Today, the old methods of harnessing power are being challenged by much smarter ways, more renewable sources of energy. This is where power meets disruption. How we store energy to feed our hunger for electricity has now become a major issue. I think the need for storage really begins when you understand how incredibly hard and unique it is to make electricity other forms of modern energy. And electricity in particular, I mean, it's essentially bottled lightning is the way we often describe it to students. And it's incredibly complex. It's a unique product whose supply has to match demand immediately. Uh, and it requires these really intricate systems with trillions of dollars of sunk investment to deliver into your home. And it is delivered into almost every home in most countries like the United States or the United Kingdom. In most of the developed world, energy is taken for granted. At the flick of a switch, we have light. At the push of a button, our televisions, washing machines or computers spring into life. But our dependence on oil, gas and coal will have to end. Climate scientists believe the use of fossil fuels will have irreversible effects on our planet. And generating energy from them is very wasteful. Most power plants waste two-thirds of the energy content of their fuels. So you have 100 units of energy, say, in a piece of coal or in some natural gas. By the time it goes through the power plant, you're only getting 33 useful units of energy out. So two-thirds is wasted as lost energy, low-grade heat, steam. Whenever you're driving by nuclear power plants late at night and you see these massive pillars of steam, that's all wasted energy. We have to find ways of harvesting energy from nature, especially the sun. But typically, renewable sources of energy can be hit and miss. They provide too much or too little energy to satisfy demand. With the march of renewables, there's been a corresponding rise in energy storage technology. The car company Tesla has been a battery pioneer for a long time. At Hornsdale in South Australia, they've developed a giant lithium-ion battery array which could power 30,000 homes for up to an hour. Australia recently topped a list of countries creating new battery storage capacity. They're followed by the United States. In 2016, China's battery storage capacity grew by an extraordinary 65% compared with the previous year. A huge leap. Globally, pumped hydro storage accounts for about 96% of all energy that is stored. In 2017, there were 1,267 energy storage projects around the world, and that represents a total of about 170 gigawatts of power. One of the most interesting energy storage ideas being tested at the moment is rather surprising. It involves making use of the latest battery technology being developed for all electric cars. Is it possible that when our cars are standing idle, they could be helping to boil our kettles? I get out to the car every morning, disconnect the car, wait for the signal to go off, and then I just go out to the, the client. In Denmark, Thomas Vester Andersen works for a local utility company, Frederiksberg for Suning. They are testing an energy storage idea called Vehicle to Grid, or V2G. The idea behind that scheme is that all electric vehicles, when they're plugged into the local supply, can be charged up from the grid. But the major difference with the scheme is this. They can also give power back to the grid, especially at times when there's peak demand. This helps smooth out fluctuations in supply. 
We call this a virtual power plant. So all these small batteries put together become one big power plant that you can then activate onto the grid. The workers come in around six or seven in the morning. We ensure they have enough energy to drive during the day. They will come back around four or five in the afternoon and then they connect again to the charger and we provide services to the grid for the rest of the evening. Nuvase software is what connects the whole system together, the cars and the chargers. Nissan produces the cars and the chargers are made by NL. The VTG system, vehicle to grid, ties in rather well with Denmark's renewable energy plans. We are installing wind turbines and solar cells all the time. So we actually have a, a problem with too much uh, sustainable wind or solar energy sometimes in our system. So the more we can uh, use or store the, the energy when it's available, the better we can use our infrastructure. If this plan works, then it's likely drivers who connect their cars to the grid will be compensated for giving power back to the system. There is one major technology issue which needs to be addressed. Does using a battery like this, putting power in and taking it out again, actually shorten its life? Because that, in the long run, could cost drivers more money. The way vehicle to grid systems work is that once the car is available and the grid requires energy, it can ask for energy and take energy out from the battery. There is no regard for what that does to the battery system and therefore that requires an intelligent transaction. There are many companies working together to make sure this technology goes in the right direction. Nuve would like to see at least 10,000 vehicles using V2G in Europe by the end of 2019. We're suddenly a small company today trying to penetrate a market that's full of very big, established, sometimes very polluting companies. Uh, it is certainly a disruption. We really hope that we'll be able to make a difference. Putting power back into a grid only applies in developed countries. In many places throughout the world, there is no grid at all. Experts estimate that more than a billion people do not have access to electricity. But this means there's a huge market for off-grid renewable energy. Since 2010, the sale of off-grid solar renewable technology has grown by about 60%. It's a whole new market with new companies jostling for position in most of Africa and parts of Asia. Peter and Dora Maherazo lives in Rwanda, about 140 kilometers from the capital and the country's largest city, Kigali. His village is not connected to an electric grid, but Peter has a plan to change his life. He's installing a solar panel to get access to power. During daylight, the solar panel charges a battery which can be used to provide lighting. But there's other uses. It can power a television and a radio, and it can charge a mobile phone. This method of harnessing power has its benefits. It's cheaper, it's greener, and certainly healthier than alternative ways of getting power, such as kerosene lamps or diesel generators. Oh, we if the experts are right, there are more than a billion people worldwide who live without much access to electricity. For many people, solar battery power systems are the only way of getting power which they can afford. One company supplying these systems, called B-Box, is holding a local roadshow to try to attract new customers. 
they already supply about 35,000 homes with solar battery packs. Off-the-shelf units like these usually cost about 150 US dollars. For many people, that is too much to pay all at once. Quite often, when people buy the system, they pay an instalment using their phones. They use the system on a pay-as-you-go basis. You do not need a very expensive utility to get power with the solar home systems. I can relate it to the mobile technology when it started. Uh, initially, people were using to have home phones. Then the mobile phone came. This is what the solar home system is. It's providing the same service that the grid provides, but without the whole physical connection. It's all done remotely. So that's how disruptive it is. Systems like these are taking off all over sub-Saharan Africa, and they're going to change people's lives dramatically. Bbox has competition from a number of other off-grid power providers. Companies such as Azuri and Mcopa Solar also operate in the same area. The introduction of technology like this is helping to close the gap between supply and demand. As the global population increases, worldwide demand for energy will only grow, especially in places like China, India and Africa. What will also grow are ways of storing renewable energy. One of the most appealing and potentially disruptive methods of storage is cold air technology. This cools air down until it is so cold it turns into a liquid. One British firm is taking this to a new level, a level at which it can help put electricity back into the national grid. Today, energy comes from many sources. Renewables are great for feeding the grid when demand is high, but the big challenge is how to store the surplus energy and then make it available when it's most needed. With the amount of renewables on the network ever increasing, um, there's a real need to um, have storage facilities and large scale storage facilities. The British firm, Highview Power, has, quite literally, developed a rather cool innovation. It's using extremely cold air as a way of storing energy. So, this is a Pillsworth storage facility. What you can see here is um, two large liquid nitrogen tanks. We're storing the energy in the form of a liquid gas. So, so basically what we do is we take in atmospheric air, we cool that down in an industrial uh, refrigeration process down to near minus 200 degrees where it turns into a liquid. We put that in low pressure tanks uh, where we store it. It can store large chunks of energy um, over long periods of time. And then when we're needing to uh, put energy back out onto the grid, we take that liquid, we pump it to a high pressure, we add some heat, and then we expand it through an expansion turbine which drives the generator and puts the electricity back onto the grid. The plant you can see behind me is still quite small. It would power around about 5,000 homes for an hour. This plant is now open and feeding the electric grid. And the plan is to introduce technology that will provide the capacity for it to become a much bigger operation. It's really getting people used to using something like liquid air, which is a hard concept to grasp. So that's the real disruptor bit, that this is a, quite an odd technology um, and we need to displace uh, more established uh, mainstream technologies you know, within the marketplace. Many technologies are still works in progress. There is no one silver bullet solution to our demand for more energy in its storage. One thing, though, is clear. There will be many different solutions from individuals, car companies, startups, 
new battery technologies from cities and from communities, all challenging the traditional energy giants who have dominated the power landscape for so long, forcing them to adapt.